much for that. Thank you very much, you guys, for um, coming. We're going to have such a great evening. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Um, I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. And the reason it's not often you get such amazing um, scientists who really know their stuff. And also, I've just sent some opinions. We've been chatting, and they, you were giving quite free opinions, which is unusual for, for most scientists. So looking forward to some more of those um, in a short while. So yeah, the plan tonight, the format, we've got our fabulous um, speakers here. Uh, we are going to um, be picking across uh, five different bits of kind of popular culture, I suppose, when it comes to the science of de-extinction. Um, there is time at the end for questions. I think it's 20 minutes at the end um, for questions uh, about any re anything that our discussions um, raise, and I suspect there will be quite a few of those things. Now, before I introduce these guys to you, um, I just wanted to give a, a, a very quick sort of brief introduction to my interest in this world. Um, I uh, spend a lot of time visiting schools, and schools have changed. When it comes to sort of dinosaurs and fossils, schools have changed quite a lot, or rather the classes have changed absolutely loads. So 15 years ago, you'd go into a class, and uh, you always have one child who knows a lot. <laughs> So the first you know, few minutes of every you know, talk you're scanning, we're working out which that child is, and, and basically doing this weird job of try, trying to sort of not let them steal the thunder off everyone else, but also geeing them up, because they, many of them, I'm sure, go on to become amazing scientists. But in the last 15 years, there's a two new people in every class. Two new people. One of them is um, Jurassic World Nerd. And Jurassic World Nerd treats the Jurassic Park franchise like a biblical text, <laughs> genuinely. And, uh, you, you know, they will be looking through your fossil collection, asking you where the Indominus Rex fossils are, which is quite difficult. This is a genetically altered, engineered dinosaur that does not exist in the real world. So it's quite hard. <laughs> Basically, I pull this face and sort of go, you know, like, this is a make-believe dinosaur. It was not a documentary. It did not happen. <laughs> so there's a Jurassic Park uh, nerd. And the other one is um, uh, Megalodon Kid. So can we just have a show of hands if you know what Megalodon is? This is a very big um, extinct shark, something like 21 meters, I think. Very large, enormous shark. And um, Megalodon went extinct, we think, about two million years ago. And unfortunately, for that kid in every class, Megalodon is definitely still around because the evidence they've found is on YouTube. And on YouTube, there is like a weird niche. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like one of these dimensions you just stroll into and you can't get out. But basically, there's a lot of different YouTubers. Hi, my name's Daz. I'm here to tell you that Megalodon's real. Here's a photo. And it's just a lot of this sort of really it's very depressing. Um, but the reason it is probably worthwhile having those uh, kids in every class is because it gives you a good chance to discuss uh, like the fact from the fiction and, and why, you know, clearly when in school it would be quite hard unravelling what is truth and what is not truth and what scientific fact and what is still unknown. Hence tonight, because I think these discussions aren't just had in classrooms, more and more de-extinction, DNA, the science of bringing animals back from the dead is you know, something that we are all talking about and something which really gets a lot of people thinking, particularly when it comes to ethics, but also when it comes to careers in science as well. So that's kind of like the secret. Well, it's not so secret. That is the aim of tonight, to really unpick some of those things and really work out the facts from the fiction. Now, the things we are going to discuss. The things we're going to discuss. Um, we're going to be talking about a film called The Iceman. Can we have a show of hands? If anyone has ever seen the 1984 classic The Iceman, Okay, you are gonna go, <laughs> you're gonna go home. It wasn't homework, but you know, I suspect many of you will go home. It's on, the whole film's on YouTube. And uh, yeah, we're getting a few nods. I Is it worth yeah, it? Yeah, Don't I'm, bother. Okay, well, well, oh, come on. Well, it's the 1980s. I would go as far to say here. classic. I mean, <laughs> go see it. So yeah, okay. So number one, The Iceman. The second is The Prospect of Immortality. Uh, one of the first books, or certainly the best, the first uh, bestseller really to um, convey to a public audience the wonder of cryogenics and potentially freezing our bodies and bringing ourselves back from the dead. Number three, hands up if you've seen a film called Jurassic Park. This is good. Yeah, this is good. I, I know it's a couple of you haven't seen Jurassic Park. That is definitely, definitely some homework for you. So you will see a bit of uh, Jurassic Park today. We're going to talk about Mr. DNA. Do you remember the Mr. DNA bit? 
I, I suspect you guys are going to hate Mr. DNA. Mr. DNA is going to get a kicking tonight. Um, and the next is the Ire Affair, which is a nice bit of um, kind of thriller, science, sci-fi, I suppose, a few of you know this. I did not know this book until it was advised by you guys at the festival that we talk about it tonight. What a great book. So we are going to talk um, a bit about that. And then last of all, has anyone seen The Meg? This was a blockbuster last year. The Stafe. Shark puncher, extraordinaire, <laughs> takes on, you know, the extinct. <laughs> Again, I love it. You're just, no, 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 no. <laughs> so that's what we're going to be uh, talking through today. We've got a few clips of the um, films, obviously, to look over, just to get our sort of uh, mental uh, gears turning, I guess. <laughs> now, you three, sorry, that was a very long spiel by me. I wanted to introduce, I'm quite an introducer of people, so I'm not one of them that says, I'll let you introduce yourselves, because nobody ever does a good version, so I'm going to do a great version for each of you. Wow. Okay. Looking forward to so, this. <laughs> first of all, we've got Dr. Jill Murray-Dixon. Uh, uh, you are CryoArx Research Fellow at the National Museum Scotland. Correct me if I'm getting any, any of this wrong. Oh, well, well. Um, Jill has used DNA to help with the conservation management of many rare and uh, very threatened species. Uh, you previously worked at the Wild Genes Lab, uh, at the zoo, is that yeah, right? Yeah, Adam okay, Zoo. Doing all right. Okay, cool. Uh, developing and using DNA-based tools to examine phylogeographic and population genetic structure, hybrid status, population size, basically a lot of things, um, across a wide range of species. And the species you've mentioned, which I love, you've got pythons, uh, peacock pheasants, tigers, and pine hoverflies. The Scottish pine hoverfly. The hover Scottish fly. pine hoverfly. That's so yes. cool. Um, I, I want to see uh, Jurassic Park with hoverflies, <laughs> is what I'm imagining. Um, uh, and in 2019, you joined the CryoArks Initiative, which we're going to hear a bit about in a second, actually. Um, and you're now based here at the museum. You're sort of half but between half here and, and the half, zoo. Yes, yeah. um, and you are establishing and coordinating facilities to Biobank Museum, Zoo, and Aquaria samples for um, CryoArks and the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria Audience. Please give a massive round of applause, please, for, for Jill. Very glad that you could be here. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, Mike, I'm going to do you next because okay. that's the order of my sheet. Uh, <laughs> Mike Bruford. Bruford? Yes. Bruford is Professor of Biodiversity at the School of Bios Biodivers uh, sorry, the School of Biosciences at Cardiff University. Uh, in your research, you use genetic tools to help conserve endangered species. You've just been talking about orangutan. We talked about panda as well. Um, also, black rhino, giant, uh, sorry, lowland gorilla as well. No hoverflies, I no, noticed, but that's no, okay. No. Um, oh, you have got what, Scottish wildcats. So that's yes. They, they bring them back in with that. Um, you work at, at the Science Policy Interface, co-chairing the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Genetics Group, which is a big deal, I know. Um, and you are director of the Frozen Ark, and you lead the UK's new zoological biobanking initiative, CryoArks, that we're going to hear about in a second. Big round of applause, please. Thank you very much, Mike. Right, our final uh, panel. I've called you a panellist. Uh, our final panellist tonight, um, Dr Sorry, Andrew Kitchener. Uh, <laughs> um, you originally started off on a TV series called Super Sense on the BBC. Does anyone remember Super Sense? It was fantastic. Yeah, really good. Uh, and, of course, today you work here um, at the museum. Um, research interests include Scottish zooarchaeology, including the occurrence and extinction of large mammals, such as brown bears and beavers, functional morphology, including reconstructions of the dodo, which we're going to talk about, of course, tonight, and the fighting behaviour of the giant deer. Is this mm -hmm. the, the deer that adorns yeah. your halls? Indeed, yeah. Fantastic. I'd love yeah. to talk to you about that. Uh, you are, today, you are the... Let me get this right. I'm looking for here. We have got... You are... You were principal curator of mammals and birds. Today, you yeah. are... All vertebrates, yeah. is that right? It's a takeover. Takeover, <laughs> absolutely right. We have a massive round of applause for Dr. <laughs> Andrew Kitchener. You do a great job. This is such a fine museum. Every time I come, I'm just absolutely blown away by it. So this is your work. This is your, your handiwork. Yes, it's amazing. It's great. great. Thank you. Cool. So, uh, OK. A couple of questions before we start, before we hear a bit more about the CryoArks initiative. Um, you mentioned in your job... Mm -hmm. You're collecting DNA samples. You're, no, in fact, you were using DNA tools to better understand threatened species. Can you just quickly, like, what, what sort of tools? Okay, so we use a mixture of what we'd call genetic and genomic tools. So this can be anything from um, sequencing the little part of the genome to maybe sort of find out uh, which species we're actually looking at. 
might sound a really obvious thing if you've got an elephant stood in front of you, you kind of know it's an elephant, but if something's actually being carved into an object and you want to know, did that actually come from an elephant? Is it ivory or something else? It's a bit, a bit more difficult. So we can, we can do that with very small bits of DNA. And then we're right up to sort of almost bordering on whole genome sequencing. So when we're looking between individuals, we look pretty different. And we kind of are pretty different, but not, and not if you compare us to an elephant as well. We're actually kind of similar. So therefore, we like to look at big stretches of DNA. And the only way to do this is by getting lots of DNA from sort of really nice, what we'd call good quality samples. So what, what does so, a, what's a typical sample of a, hover, of a pine hoverfly? Oh, so pine hoverfly, yeah. They're, they're a is it like a, I'm imagining <laughs> just plucking the wing off it. And, there we go. Is no, it like? so it, it can depend. Um, so when you're looking at insects, actually insects and invertebrates are actually really difficult to get DNA from for a whole bunch of other reasons. We like blood samples, and okay. you can get lots of that from mammals. From, from invertebrates, it can be anything. It could be a leg. You could get DNA from a leg to do some small bits of work. Um, sometimes you might have to use the whole body of an animal, so it depends. Um, but yeah, it really depends on what question you're looking at, how much DNA you need and what quality of DNA. So we do take whole flies, but we also sometimes just take a little part of them. Okay, cool. And you also mentioned environmental DNA. Can you just give us a quick yeah, summary of what this is? Yeah, that's kind of the coolest thing on the block at the moment. Okay. And it's unfortunately the thing which has an awful lot of uh, what's the word? Expectation from, from a, a lot of big sort of <laughs> government bodies. <laughs> eDNA, environmental DNA, is essentially DNA you collect from the environment. So that could be a pool of water. Um, it could actually be from the air as well, if you're looking at pollen species, um, or it could be from mud sample. So you can actually filter out the DNA that's in that water, and you can start seeing maybe what species have passed through the water or are living in the water without actually catching that species. So very, very cool. Very difficult to do. Okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah, lots of great ideas for but is this it. What the, the government quite likes this idea because, like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm quite into great crescent newts. It seems a strange thing to admit so early yep. in our meeting, but. No, but, but it's a great but, example yeah, of it. So, that, you know, if you want to know where these newts are, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, developers wanting to know if the ponds on their properties that they're trying to sell off have newts, you go in there with your swab, your sample, no newts here. <laughs> but obviously, it's not as easy as that, is it? I mean, it's. It, it's <clears throat> I think it's the quite if you look at the questions where we're doing um, a lot of work to try and work out just what accuracy you can get with it and you're right it's it's a common tool now for actually surveying for great crested newts which is brilliant um, there's still an error associated with that so we're not saying it's this silver bullet where you're going to definitively say this is here but it's going to give you a really good idea about what one species is there but I think what really where it comes into it's its strength, if you like, is that you can get all that DNA and you can do whole community assessments. So actually you find more species than if you were doing maybe a visual survey. And I think that's where it really comes into its power because the amount of time you'd have to spend to get everything from the really small things and you need a lot of specialists to identify those species. Whereas if you're running the DNA, there's some seriously cool kind of like tech now where you can do the bioinformatics and identify whole assemblages of species. So that's probably where it comes into its strength rather than sort of I love the crested newt as well. My, my PhD was on newts. I have a really? special yeah, fondness for newts. <laughs> but ultimately, it's for doing those big kind of community level surveys. And that's okay. where it's a really good tool. So. Yeah, OK, cool. And then, uh, Andrew, for, for your, um, can we talk, you know, megalo, megalo, megaloceros, I want to call it. Is that right? For megaloceros, the, yeah. Megaloceros, you said. Yeah. OK, it's one of those words I've read, but I don't think I've ever said before. So this is the Irish elk, the, 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 the big yeah, deer, I guess. The big deer. So how do we go from, OK, you're, you're, you've got the bones mm -hmm. and you, you've got, you know what you're doing. Yeah. How do we get from a, a pile of bones to making a real world uh, assessment of how that animal lived and fought and behaved? Yeah, well, I, my PhD was on the mechanical design of horns and antlers. And so what you're looking at is behavior. So the key thing is about how these things fit together. And if you hold the antlers in a particular orientation, they'll just slot together very nicely. And if you know that, then you can start looking at the mechanical properties of the bone that make up the antlers. And I had a great time. When I was unemployed after I finished my PhD, I went all the way to Grenoble to play with a nuclear reactor. <laughs> and uh, there's a technique called neutron diffraction, whereby you can fire a neutron beam at a piece of bone, and it will measure how highly orientated the calcium crystals are in that piece of bone. And what we found for the giant deer was that the degree of orientation of, of those crystals was more highly aligned than in any other bone ever recorded. And that means it was experiencing seriously high stresses. 
Now, uh, there's a, a famous evolutionary biologist, Stephen Jay Gould, said the Irish elk or the giant deer couldn't use its antlers for fighting, and they were just sort of elaborate advertisement ho hoarding saying, Yarboo sucks, go away. Uh, but we were able to prove, both from the structure and from the material, that in fact they were they had evolved for fighting and for, uh, for experiencing really quite high stresses. That is yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's lovely. Okay, so and the and the dodo. So we had a, I had a probably it was a moment <laughs> more weirdly emotional than <laughs> I've experienced for about uh, for ages uh, in the green room. <laughs> it didn't involve newts, but it did involve dodo bones. And uh, I actually wanted to hold some dodo bones. Can I tell these guys that? Is that yeah, a, yeah. And it was just like, oh my gosh, it was absolutely extraordinary. So what is, what is your, uh, your fascination with dodos? What, because it's obviously a specialist interest for you. What, what is the magic of dodos for you? Well, I, I had absolutely no interest in dodos whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, I was asked by the chairman of our trustees whether I could make a replica dodo for him. And uh, so rather than just sort of copying what everybody else did, uh, I decided to go back to the original historical accounts, look at skeletons and, or, and, and so on. So uh, the problem is that in the past, the dodo has been depicted as a very grossly fat bird. And I just thought, well, this doesn't really look as if it's going to survive properly. And in fact, the very early illustrations of dodo show it to be a very thin bird. And when you do, you calculate the stresses in the leg bones and so on, in the similar way with the Irish elk antler, it shows that, in fact, it was a much thinner bird. And do you want to see what it looks like? Because I have we actually it? brought back the dodo single-handed. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got the oven-ready version, so you can see how slender it is. But Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that a thing of beauty? Wow. It's, it's, it's so muscular-seeming. <laughs> Do we think, do we, do we, can we look at the, can we assess like how fast it would have moved or anything like that? It's just, as you say, um, comparing it to this, which looks like very rotund, let's I, say. This looks, looks like, like a real dynamic nice speech. That looks like clothes well. moth we've got to it. <laughs> but it, it's not, the colour scheme's not right either. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so th this was just to prove that in fact that they were quite, there are historical accounts saying that although these birds had, had some little flaps as wings, they could actually run around very fast. So again, we know that they could move fast, and they weren't grossly fat and sitting around, you know, couch potato style. And this, you, I noticed the, the yellow tip of the beak, is that yeah. based on uh, sort of observations at the time, or is that something you uh, see on specimens? This, this is essentially a giant pigeon. And what I notice with looking at um, tropical pigeons is that they have this... Uh, tip of the beak, which, as you'll see in this one, is depicted as being dark. But in fact, what's happened is that that's based on a preserved specimen where blood is caught underneath the keratin at the end of the beak, and it shows black through. And the original colour was this sort of yellowy, horny colour. And is that a, that's an advert? Is it this the the more, the more yellow, the less um, STDs it has? I don't know. <laughs> this is one of the problems. We don't know very much about the behaviour of these uh, birds. Did they? You know, p oh, a, another question. Did, so, do, is it all pigeons that regurgitate the, the, this milk stuff for their babies? Is I that think flamingos do it as well? Do they? Okay. Yeah. Did the dodo do that? Do we think? I don't know. Probably very likely. Yeah. And do we know anything about noises? All these questions no. are spiralling out. I mean, no, we do know a bit about their breeding biology. Um, there was a, a Frenchman called Francois Koch, who uh, described the breeding behaviour, and it's and he said that it laid an egg the size of a halfpenny roll. Well, how big's a halfpenny roll? <laughs> anyway, so in, in the East London Hapney Museum rolled. in South Africa, yeah. there, this is a replica of an egg, an alleged dodo egg. And when I worked out how this scaled with the size of the bird, the dodo would have weighed 156 kilograms, whereas it weighed about 10, 12 kilograms. So this was actually an odd ostrich egg. Fortunately, there was another account of Koch's uh, description of the dodo where it said that the egg was the size of a pelican's egg. And if you use that, it predicts the weight of the dodo absolutely precisely. So it wow. know, we know it laid eggs the size of pelicans. Which is, yeah, what about this sort of size? About, about that size. Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. Much smaller. You must be really proud of that. Yeah, no, it's great. And, and the feathered version is on display in the survival gallery. Cool, lovely. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, Mike, would this be okay for you to just outline a bit more about the cryoarchs? Yeah. Uh, 
uh, project? Would that be sure? Yeah, right? uh, so um, basically, the CryoArcs project is a a three-year project initially, which where we're trying to create the UK's first coordinated zoological biobank. So when people think about biobanks normally, or then they hear about biobanks, it's usually human tissue that they're thinking about that's in, in biobanks and hospitals. So maybe cancer um, uh, tissue, um, f stuff for, for research, basically. Um, uh, and, and so um, and a lot of investment's gone into human biobanking because it's of, of its relevance and importance for health studies. Um, biobanking of uh, animal and plant specimens has, really, has received a lot less uh, funding and activity and almost no coordination. So if you go to a zoo, for example, and a typical zoo, um, then they may, they may either have their own vet or a vet that visits. And when an animal they gets sick or, or when one sadly uh, passes away, um, they may collect a piece of tissue, um, and that tissue may then be put into a tube and put into a freezer, just like the freezer that you and I have in our houses. Um, but oftentimes, it hasn't been done labelled correctly, or it hasn't been done properly, and the freezer may break down, and then be restarted, um, or even worse, um, it, may, it, you know, it may even be that um, the material has just become completely scrambled and moved around over time as as we all go into our freezers and move the sausages around you know that, that can happen with with tubes as well and that's mm. that's what we're dealing with and, and and the idea is that we stop all of that one of the main reasons for that is because um you know we realize now more and more that these captive breeding programs and these animals in in zoos and and um uh, captive collections are a really precious resource um and it, we can collect material from those um, we can we can also do that, and then we don't need to go back out into the wild and collect samples from wild specimens and and disturb those as well. So, basically, what this is about is bringing together all of the legacy collections that are out there, all from all of the zoos around Britain, from the museums, from the university labs where people have gone out, and and if you add up the amount of field work time and how much that would cost nowadays. You know, we're talking about many millions of pounds worth of man effort, person effort. And, and, and so what we want to try and do is bring that all together and maintain it in a way that researchers and conservationists can use that material um, for research and for conservation programs. So, for example, if you want to know whether your captive population of tigers um, has a problem with inbreeding, we can use the kind of approaches that Jill described, DNA profiling, um, and we can go back and we can look at the captive population, we can use that material and we can compare that to data that we have from databases of wild populations and figure out whether or not there's a problem. Um, if you suspect there's hybridization, in the past there's been hybridization, for example, in zoos between, um, between Indian uh, lions and African lions, but people oftentimes didn't pick that up. Um, and some of the record keeping and the pedigrees didn't pick it up either. So, so we can do a genetic test of that. Um, and, and there are lots and lots of different types of tests that we can do um, using that material that directly um, uh, help conservation management projects. But there's also a wider thing, which is basic research. Um, in the genome era, I mean, uh, as, as Jill was saying, we're, we're now able to, for a trivial amount of money, for a couple of hundred quid, sequence a genome of any species, literally. And when I, when I started working in this area in, um, in, in, in the mid-80s, that was just a complete fantasy. Um, and in a sense, you know, what we're going to be talking about this evening is about how things have changed over the last three decades, you know, since things like Jurassic Park originally came out and, and the, the way the landscape has changed. We've gone from, uh, you know, spending a billion pounds over 10 years to sequence the first human genome to be, me being able to take a sample, 300 quid, send it off in the post, 10 days later, I've got a genome. So have we got genome sequence for every threatened species on no. Earth? Is that the no, point no, you know? No. And that's, that's part of the <coughs> point of cryoarch. So we're getting to the point where, um, where we can do that, but we need the material, and we need that material to be properly sourced, properly identified, so that people are not going to waste their money. Yeah. And on top of that, we can, it's, it's become so um, 
easy to do now that we can not only sequence one individual, we can sequence the DNA of lots of individuals within a species to find out how they differ. You know, yeah. why do you and I look different? What are the what are the single nucleotides in the genome that make us look that make us look different? And that may not be particularly interesting in you in the case of you and me, uh, but for a an animal which is adapting well to its new captive conditions or could potentially be put back in the wild versus one where we suspect that there may be problems if we do that if we look at the genome it will give us more information and allow us to be much cleverer in the way that we use the genetic material yeah, and, 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 and do our conservation properly yeah but so at what stage are we in in that process, you know, how long, how long has this project been going on so far? Well, we've only been going on for uh, about nine months at the moment. So it's a three-year programme initially. So we're, at the moment, what we're doing is we are um, we're getting... We, well, actually, uh, the, the freezers have arrived uh, here in the, in the museum and, um, and in, in the zoo. Um, we are gearing up to start our, our big sampling drive. So we're going to be... Um, collecting material from from everywhere, but but from zoos as well, from zoos, from mu museums, and from um, from from university labs, and we're going to be bringing it all together. Cool. Uh, right. And it... and we're going to put it into a single database, which anybody here will be able to publicly query That's and great. find wow. out where the samples are and be able to do the work um, that they need to do. And so, and that's, that's the ultimate aim. And so it's a three year process at the moment and, um, and you know, we're, we're, we're still, you know, at the fairly early stages of it. And the, and the excitement behind that, the freezers have arrived. This isn't just three <laughs> Zanussi freezers. <laughs> you keep your chips Talk us in, okay? The, freezers, so what sort the of freezers. size? I mean, we're, so we're the, talking. Don't put your sandwiches in here. None of that. Okay. So no. we are housing our samples in freezers which sit at minus 80 degrees. So, so quite considerably closer than the ones that you have at home. They're quite beastly. So each one will take about 40,000 samples. So there's a huge capacity in these things. Mm. Um, and so across the, the, the Edinburgh, hub which is what we are as, as cryoites we're going to have four of these beasts for kind of storing samples so they're fairly big and this is why the excitement because it's a very new facility that we really don't have th this capacity up until now and it's in it's scotland's first biobank hub certainly the quarter first of a million one, samples so. here in scotland but then we have the opportunity to sample to, to store um, two or three times that many yeah. down at the Natural History Museum in London, where we don't only have minus 80 freezers, we have liquid nitrogen freezers, which okay. freeze um, samples down to one not minus 196. And by going colder, what, that pre better pre Much, preserves. much longer okay. um, preservation times, mm -hmm. and you can, you can preserve living cells in that, in, in those, in, at that minus 196. Okay. Um, and and that's, that's how sperm uh, and, and um, cell lines are, are routinely stored. But this, this database is going to save hours of my time. A researcher <laughs> asked me for a list of eight uh, samples that we have in order to do some research. Just to get that list of 30 odd specimens took me an hour. Uh, that's time I could spend doing something far more useful. So if there's a database, they could find out for themselves. Yeah. And yeah. So and that's going to hugely save And will time. your dodo DNA, can you get it from your bones? That was just yeah, you, well, of course. Like, I guess my you DNA is all over them now, but... You just, you just wanted to see the bone again, didn't you? So, I did. Yeah. But, you know, will that be so, one of the specimens within no, this? No, because the, these are tissue samples. So it's, in okay. our case, it's mainly muscle tissue, but there will be blood as well and, mm -hmm. and other kinds of tissue. So it's things, that, as Jill said, where you get high-quality DNA. You can get DNA out of that. Well, I'm sure Mike could. Um, I couldn't. <laughs> uh, but it's going to be quite poor quality. So I think in terms of like we were talking about the freezing as well with the liquid nitrogen, it's because it snap freezes, correct? Mm. It sort of does it so very quickly that you don't get kind of the big formation of the ice crystals, which basically breaks things down. And, and DNA is really susceptible to falling apart on us. It doesn't necessarily hang together if you keep it in the wrong conditions. So that's why we're sort of trying to set up the best way of preserving these samples to make sure that they're not just accessible for us to use, but also for lots of people in the future, you know, future yeah. generations really, yeah. to have this resource. And yeah, and the amount of time that will save, because for the average Average project you might want to look at it might sound fairly easy to kind of say can we work out what this tiger in the wild has eaten now it starts off with a lovely poo sample so the technicians have a very glamorous job but if you don't actually know what sort of if you don't have reference sequences of DNA sitting somewhere to compare that sample to 
how do you know what it's eaten? It's a bit like saying, well, can you identify an apple if you've never seen one? Do you know? yeah. so, so this is why having this sort of database and this resource is just so important for having a big reference collection that we can then sort of go back to and say, well, look, you know, what is it? So, cool, so, yeah. that sounds fantastic. Now, you're talking about freezing there. This is probably a good tie into our first uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. video. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. prepare yourselves for one of the sci-fi <laughs> greats. Um, <laughs> I was trying to find out who some of the actors were so we could talk about it. Uh, no. no. Who is this one in Iceman? Yeah, da hang on. Danny Glover. Danny Glover, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, Danny <laughs> Glover. Um, okay, so, hello, up there. Can we start our first clip? It's going to be about a minute. We're going to watch this clip, then we'll have a bit of a chat. I think he might be conscious. But I don't think he's going to make the Super Bowl. Oh. <laughs> Don't panic. Everybody just take it easy. Put your hands off. Hands off. Heartbeat's okay. Another valium. What is that? Kill that man. Okay, okay, I got him. Okay. 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 And if I told you how it ends, you wouldn't believe me. Because <laughs> it ends with him <laughs> essentially uh, considering a helicopter as a sky god uh, that takes said cave person to heaven, and, but then he dies, he commits suicide. He uh, hangs onto the helicopter to try and go up with it, and then he falls. He falls, you it's see. It's a very dramatic ending. ending. Yeah, yeah, very yeah, dramatic, very yeah. Dramatic. It's so strange we don't talk about this film today. It's almost like it didn't even penetrate the cultural zeitgeist in any way. Um, OK, so the obvious one there. So, in case you missed it, uh, our, our cave person... I always say cave person because people just use the word caveman, just willy-nilly, you know. But, yeah, cave person and uh, frozen in ice, uh, having some sort of panic attack and seeing a human with a beard like his and going, ah, oh, yes, we're fine. So, could you... Could you I mean, the, the obvious question is, has that ever happened? Has anyone ever frozen to death and been able to be resuscitated? No, going no straight away. So the second question, could that happen after 50,000 years, is also a no, I'm guessing. Yep. yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what is the process that stops that happening? We hear that one all the time, like, oh, frozen solid, Captain Caveman, you know, that cartoon. So, what is it that goes wrong with the freezing process that yeah. stops life? Well, um, I, the, the most important thing is that when, when uh, cells freeze, oftentimes what happens is that they have ice crystals in them. And, um, and when that happens, when the cells defrost again, the whole thing ruptures. So if you had a, 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 a cave person um, defrosting in front of you, the likelihood is that it would be a rather messy process because all of the, all of the ice, ice crystals that would become embedded in, in the cellular structure and the organs would, of course, defrost, and they've been holding the structure uh, as it is until that point, and then the whole thing will just go... It'll, so, you know, the classic mush okay. situation would happen. Um, we know, you know, there are organisms, there are animal species that do this for a living um, in, 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 in reality. Um, there are mammals even that can live during hibernation below uh, zero. Uh, there's a, there's a, um, a ground squirrel that can survive in, at, at, at about minus three degrees centigrade uh, during hibernation. There are... So how are they doing? Are they... Uh, assimilating chemicals that so, like antifreezes, so or there is are, it? There are three different 
chemical processes that are operating, and they operate differently in different species. So there are, there are beetles that can, that can literally survive at minus 50 degrees C. They do that mainly by a, pro, by, by a combination of flooding their cells with antifreeze. Now, what antifreeze actually is, is a, is a series of chemicals that bind water molecules. So they pre prevent the water molecules then from crystallizing, okay? So they're locking them up. Glycogen, you know, is a classic example of that. So they, they, they flood their, they have, they, they have antifreeze in their cells, but they also undergo a process known as lyophilization, which is basically freeze drying. So they desiccate okay. when they go, in, uh, go under as well. So for the species that live that can survive for periods of time at minus 50, they have to deploy a couple of different appro approaches. Um, other species, so, so there's a wood frog that, that is able to live, um, you know, survive periods of, of time at, um, you know, minus 15, minus 20. Um, and that does it rather differently. That uses mainly, um, it, its cells secrete uh, molecules which act then as nuclei for ice crystal formation. So it basically says, right, if I push the chemicals outside of my cells and the ice forms there, it's not going to inform inside my cells. Yeah. And so it basically does it by sequestering the ice outside of the cellular system. Okay. Um, and you know, and different different species do it do, do it in a different in, in lots of different ways. Um, the problem is that those antifreezes are really costly things to produce. And when you've got an animal whose physiology is slowed down because they're in uh, almost suspended anim animation or, or hibernation for sure, torpor, then, then actually uh, they can't keep producing that antifreeze forever. It degrades and then and that's the problem. Therein lies the problem. Producing your own antifreeze is, is, uh, is, is, is not something you can do indefinitely. Okay, there's another yeah. issue with defrosting as well. It's, a lot of these animals are, are quite small. Yeah. Uh, but if you try to do it with a human or an elephant or a woolly mammoth, what happens is the outside thaws first, but the inside is still frozen. And so the outside goes rotten while the inside is still fresh. Oh, and, goodness. And that's why a lot of these mammoths come out, and they look great to begin with, and then you touch them, and then they just go, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> OK. Yeah, and so. well, with those mammoths, how many, like, this is just a general question, really, but like, how many mammoths do we find in that condition uh, not with a beard, but, you know, in this kind of, uh, this sort of state every year, you know, how many do we discover? And, and are they suddenly, you know, the DNA is quickly taken from those individuals? Do we have freezers filled with, like, mammoth steaks, in other words? Adrian one. I think there are large freezers in Siberia which have got remains of these carcasses, but it might be a leg or it might be a whole body, but all the furs come off it, which tells you that it's already decaying, but it's still... You can see all the tissue there underneath, but it's not in a very good uh, state of preservation. And of course, people are actively sampling these uh, animals in order to try and get some high quality DNA to try and recreate. And them. has that happened? Yeah, and was it is, is, is Sweden, uh, Sweden where that was taking place, or is it? Yeah. But you know, yeah. where you've got that, you've got that experiment, if you like, happening yeah. right now. Yeah. What, yeah. where we've got the mammoth DNA, and uh, is this right? We put it into kind of this is. You know, this is Jules Howard science, so this is not very good. You'll have to correct me here. But, you know, you've got that DNA, and you can insert that into an elephant egg, and then the elephant gives birth to a mammoth. Is this the kind of... Well, Am I having a fever yeah. dream? No, no, so, 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 so people have been able to sequence the mammoth genome. So that's that, that you know, we, and there have been quite a few individuals whose genome has been sequenced now. So we, we get a lot, there's, a, you know, there's, there's been a lot of really interesting work done. There was that population, the last living population of mammoths, which was on Wrangell Island. Mm -hmm. um, that, that they have sequenced the genomes of those individuals and they worked out that they went extinct essentially because of inbreeding depression. Okay. So, so we have gene, whole genome sequences of lots of extinct um, Arctic and Antarctic species. Whose, whose DNA has been preserved in a good enough condition. Contrast that with the tropics, where we have essentially zip, because you know, um, it's very, very difficult to, to get preservation of material because of, in tropical rainforest ecosystems, the, the soil is very acidic, nothing, nothing essentially 
is conserved. Yeah. So it, no, there is you can get incredible information uh, from it, but but no, there aren't any hybrids being uh, produced yet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Where I got that from? I think it must have been some sort no, of. No, I think there is a plan to do it, but whether it will be successful oh, yeah. is, a, is an yeah. entirely different yeah. matter. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about the, 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 the freezing process, the effect that has on brains, and that is where um, the prospect of immortality comes next. Now, this is. Do you know what I've always. Does anyone ever have young kids who and watch CBeebies? Does anyone ever watch CBeebies? <laughs> okay, so you know the bedtime story. I've always wanted to do the bedtime story on CBeebies. <clears throat> right, this is my big moment. This is my audition. Okay. So um, this, this book, genuinely, I remember my dad having this book um, and gave rise to the idea of, you know what? You want to live forever, pay a company to freeze your body, and then, you know, in future, you can be revived and, <laughs> and be happy. <laughs> Basically, that's the, 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 the crux of it. And in fact, this is the, the summary, the, his summary, okay. The fact... At very, <clears throat> oh, I've lost the audition already, I'll never get on CBeebies. <clears throat> At very low temperatures, it is possible right now to preserve dead people with essentially no deterioration indefinitely. So this is 1963, I think this book is. Okay, um, the assumption, if civilization endures, medical science should eventually be able to repair almost any damage to the human body, including freezing damage and senile debility or other cause of death. Hence, <laughs> this is the best summary ever. Hence, we only need to arrange to have our bodies after we die stored in suitable freezers against the time when science may be able to help us. No matter what kills us, whether old age or disease, and even if freezing techniques are still crude when we die, sooner or later, our friends of the future should be equal to the task of reviving and curing us. This is the essence of my main argument. Now, as far as the... Uh, the chapters go. I'm not going to read loads, but there's some things that I love about it. So I'm about to turn 40, so I'm, well, I just love this bit. If you're about 40 years old now, then probably when you die in another 30 or 40 years, physicians or technicians paid by your insurance company will bank your blood, perfuse your parts, and lay you to rest, not eternal rest, but temporary, and not in the cold ground, but in a cold freezer. A few years later, perhaps, they will slide your wife in beside you. Which I loved. And then I noticed at the start of the book, it's dedicated to his wife. And uh, the author, Robert Essinger, died in 2011. So I was like, I wonder if his wife was slid in next to him. And she was. And so was his second wife. Oh. <laughs> Which is quite interesting, isn't it? And his mum. So when they do resuscitate, he's going to have the most awkward conversations. Yeah. Like, you guys don't really know each other, but OK, here we go. I just absolutely love that. I thought that was absolutely genius. But as far as the um, dealing with the process of uh, cells fracturing, as you said, particularly brain, uh, cells in the brain. So the ro robot surgeons of the future will have powers now only faintly foreshadowed, but beginnings have already been made in cell surgery. This is how he puts it, okay. Individual cells have been successfully oper operated upon, e.g. transplanting nuclei, nuclei into enucleated amoeba, even cross-species. Thus, if brute force methods are necessary, it is not inconceivable that huge surgeon machines working 24 hours a day for decades or even centuries will tenderly restore the frozen brain cell by cell. Wow. <laughs> so come on, it's 50 years later. Where are our big surgeon machines? Well, it's, it's like, it's wonderful. I mean, you know, the, that when people were writing, you know, that's when Isaac Asimov was writing um, books as well. It's fantastic to see how, how they were, were thinking. Um, and you can never write these things off. Um, but, and, and there is, there are, there's a company called Cryonics that is indeed freezing human bodies. So, and I, I think a, a, a 10 or a dozen British people have had their bodies frozen. Yeah, that's um, where he, he uh, yeah, is. Yeah. yeah, and they're basically flooding them with antifreeze and, um, you know, uh, and, and, and freezing them down within minutes of death. Um, there's the website, you can go on the website and see how the process works. But, but of course, um, the problem is that the, that technology that he's describing there, these legions of robot um, <laughs> surgeons and, uh, you know, this kind of brave new world technology doesn't exist. And, and there's every reason to believe that that kind of 
technology will, will take a very, very long time indeed, if ever it becomes available. But would people have said that about DNA 20 years ago? You said how quickly, how fast our knowledge in that area has yeah. advanced. Is there any chance that, you know, in 50 years time we'll be like, wow, these robot surgeons? Well, you, 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 you can, ne you of course, can never say never. Um, but it seems, it seems like, a, 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 you know, mo most people who, do, who study these kind of cryogenic methods think that the, the problem is very, very difficult to solve. Well, for all of the reasons that Adrian, uh, uh, that, um, that uh, uh, Andrew mentioned earlier. So the, the is it cry, cry, cryonics? Cryonics is the science, UK is it? But is, you, yeah. the company you mentioned was? Cryonics UK. Cryonics UK, okay. Yeah. Are they doing a, a similar thing that you mentioned about storing DNA samples? Do they use the same technique that, that you guys would use as part of the CryoArts project? No, they're, they're, they're doing very, very bespoke um, uh, freezing for, for you know using using um, anti use, using all of these different cryoprotectants and basically um, you know putting putting that material into into different organs. Yeah, the problem that you've got, of course, is any single organ is an incredibly heterogeneous tissue that's got you know blood vessels, it's got muscle, it's got all of these different things, all of which will freeze in a different way. Okay. And, oh, okay. and defrost in a different way and have different chemical underpinnings. So the, the, the complexity, even of just doing a brain, is astonishing. What, what, um, you know, we hear a lot about stem cells in the media. Yeah. Can, is it possible to collect the DNA of a certain body part and from that, uh, let's say, I don't know, an appendix or something like that, mm. and from that reconstruct the dead animal or the dead human, I suppose? Well, um, Embryonic stem cell technology is very, very, uh, is, you know, is very promising. The, the classic example at the moment that people are talking about is the northern white rhino, where we have just a couple of, of females still, still alive, and they're actively talking about using stem cell technology, um, pluripotent stem cells, to be able to take material and, and actually at least make reproductive material. Okay. okay, and so, could that be the case for insects and stuff like that? You know, you talked about invertebrates, how, more dif how it was more difficult to collect that kind of DNA. Could this... Yeah, I mean, we're, we're obviously, so within cryox, we're preserving the tissues for, for the, the sole purpose of getting sort of DNA and genetic material back out of them. The sort of the cell technology requires, as we were saying about the antifreezes, there are special storage mediums they need to go into, and minus 80 wouldn't mm. cut it for that. Yeah for that purpose, yeah. um, but there are people looking into the best way for preserving different cells, so, so obviously for doing the, the, we were saying both, the, there's the three types, isn't there, I was doing my homework on this one, so there's the, <laughs> the pluripotent, the totipotent, and then the, the multipotent, I think, mm. so depending on how many different cells they can turn into, so, you know, once a cell has sort of turned into a particular type of tissue, essentially, it's, it's all on a one-way path, you know, and now what they're working out is if you take one that's already become a particular type of tissue, can you put it back to yeah. that sort of, that, that stage to make it into something different? But if you think about how many different cells and how many different organs are in the, the body, I don't know how long all, that... I pretty mean, much all of the preserved cell lines for animal species that are out there are what's known as fibroblast, and they come from skin, mm -hmm. and, that, and pretty much that's it. Okay. Yeah. And of course, putting aside legal and ethical considerations, you could, of course, clone somebody in theory. Mm -hmm. uh, but the trouble is, they may be genetically the same, but of course, they'll be a different person, just as an identical twin is a different person. So that's not going to solve it either. And I guess that's just it. You freeze a brain, you bring back the physical structure of it, but that's not necessarily a brain, is it? Brain does a whole lot more than just sit there in your head. As a There's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there that I'm not sure you could freeze all those processes. So I think that's And all the memories and so on might disappear. Yeah. Might be well, that's the other thing yeah. that it comes up. It's in modern day sci-fi as well, quite, you know, quite a lot. But in this, in, in this age, you know, it's about uh, keep those brain cells and the memories will beautifully be rendered forever and you just plop them back in and off you go. Yeah. And then nowadays we talk about, uh, uh, oh, there's a Johnny Depp film that I saw recently where, you know, basically you can download, you download your brain, of course you do it on your phone, why not do it with a brain? It's, that, I assume, again, is just hokum. <laughs> that could not be the case as far as we know. No. Yeah? No, no, absolutely. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> well, if you're pessimistic now, get ready for Mr. DNA from Jurassic Park. Yes. Um, so, can we have our next uh, vid? <laughs> I just absolutely love Jurassic Park. A hundred million years ago, there were mosquitoes, just like today. 
And just like today, they fed on the blood of animals, even dinosaurs. Sometimes, after biting a dinosaur, the mosquito would land on the branch of a tree and get stuck in the sap. After a long time, the tree sap would get hard and become fossilized, just like a dinosaur bone, preserving the mosquito inside. This fossilized tree sap, which we call amber, waited for millions of years with the mosquito inside until Jurassic Park scientists came along. Using sophisticated techniques, they extract the preserved blood from the mosquito and, bingo, dino DNA. A full DNA strand contains three billion genetic codes. If we looked at screens like these once a second for eight hours a day, it'd take two years to look at the entire DNA strand. It's that long. Since it's so old, it's full of holes. Now that's where our geneticists take over. Thinking machine supercomputers and gene sequencers break down the strand in minutes. And virtual reality displays show our geneticists the gaps in the DNA sequence. We use the complete DNA of a frog to fill in the holes and complete the code. <clears throat> and now we can make a baby dinosaur. There's a lot going on there. Um, I could hear you guys go, oh, oh dear, oh, sort of coughing and quietly to yourselves. Um, so first of all, where are your VR displays? Your headgear to move around some sort of strange DNA codes. <laughs> yeah. So I'm assuming you don't have that at the lab? No? No, no not yet? Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the frog gap is very important for the story, of course, that. That, I assume, it, it, you ca can we just mix species like can we go there's a gap there that's shoving some frog legs you know can that assume it's we're no nearer than that i mean it's hard to know i mean i think it you know i actually think that that's completely brilliant don't get me wrong i mean and and so interesting and visionary for the time but there are of course a lot of problems with it What's, um, what amazes me about that is that i would say as far as science communication goes, that probably Fantastic. did more than anything in the last 25 years I can think of, because the, the working knowledge that we all have of DNA comes from, in my generation yeah. anyway, comes from that. From that, comes yeah, from seeing absolutely. That. No, it's fantastic. Mm. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is that um, the first thing you've got to do is identify where those gaps are, mm -hmm. right? Um, even if we could sequence DNA from amber or, and from even whole animals preserved in amber, which we can't, you then get your genome and it would be incredibly fragmented and there would be, it wouldn't be gaps, it's, it's the opposite. So you'd have little bits and it would be nearly all gap. So it would be the complete inverse of gaps. And it how would, be... would you get around that problem of, uh, yeah, as you say, you've got mysterious DNA, yeah. how do you... Uh, at what point do you go, oh my gosh, I think it's going to be a T-Rex. Oh no, it's a, you know, it's a yeah. hedgehog or so, you know, so, like. So, I mean, the, the first and most obvious problem with all of this is that the closest living relatives of dinosaurs are not frogs. Mm -hmm. yeah. they are, they're, they're in fact birds. So if you were going to do this, you, were, you would you'd use a bird, uh, bird genome. And we have now about 250, 300 bird genomes sequenced. Um, so there are lots and lots of bird genomes. So you could make a consensus bird genome, if you like. And then if you could sequence dinosaur DNA, then you could start mapping bits of the dinosaur DNA onto the bird genome, and you may start getting a sense of where the gaps are. But we are talking about, you know, six, a very, very, very long time ago and lots and lots of evolutionary time since then. So mapping those gaps might be very, very difficult. Um, but unfortunately, the simple reality is that, you know, it's in, you know, the oldest DNA that we've sequenced so far is probably no, no more than about 400,000 years, wow. not 65 million years. And, most, mm. and, and it's extremely difficult to even imagine going beyond a million years. People have done some theoretical analysis and, uh, of the rate of decay and, and the actual sequence of the DNA doesn't just break it chemically modifies. And the theoretical maximum amount of time under absolutely ideal conditions that we could expect DNA to survive is one and a half million years. 
That's interesting. OK, well, that's within the realms for, for our friend that here. Is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, But there are practical considerations there. Why was he sampling the mosquito's bottom? <laughs> now, the blood has been digested at that point. Also, yeah. I don't think, was it in mosquito? I, I don't think it I think it's a, it a, it's a crane fly. Well, I thought it, it looked like well, it, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is, of course, where did the egg come from? Um, <laughs> To hatch your dinosaur out of. So there are a few practical considerations as well. Yeah. Mm. No, no, go, nothing, no game changers, you no, know. No. <laughs> but saying that, we can get mammal, bits of mammal DNA from an insect if that insect has been feeding on a mammal. So this, so actually getting, so that bit, yeah. that bit's correct, but yeah, if you, if you okay. took it from yeah. the right part of the, the animal in, and, yes. and not once it's being heavily <laughs> but, digested, but then, not then one it's... one that's been in amber. No, probably no, not no. one that's been in amber, no. but certainly that we can use it for looking. So leeches are a very good way of oh. actually maybe doing a potential uh, a mammal survey, if you like, of an area. If you pick them up in a rainforest, you can actually get lots of different bits of mammal DNA and potentially identify what species are kicking around. So, um, so there's a few insects that have been used for that. So, 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 so um, <laughs> okay, so we've got the, the leeches, we've got insects. Is there... Um, a couple of years ago, this is an amazing piece in amber. Have you seen this dinosaur's tail? It, it's quite a small tail, mm -hmm. uh, a little sort of two-legged theropod dinosaur tail. And so, in other words, we, if we physically got access to a piece of dinosaur, yeah. even still, we wouldn't be able to get DNA from it because Absolutely of that not. Absolutely process. Not. Wow, that is a shocking truth, ladies and gentlemen. I'm shocked, at, genuinely gutted about it. <laughs> so, so okay, bring it back to, to our to our dodo here. If, if you, I'm going to be the Ian Malcolm here. If we can do that, if we can bring back a dodo, should we? I'm going to, I'm going to throw that at, at all of you. It feels like your question first as well. Of course, it would be fascinating to see. But how much is it going to cost? And, and, uh, and what, uh, yeah, where would you put it? I mean, <laughs> and, and, and how much know. of its behaviour is innate? How much of it is learned? And who does it learn it from? So would it be a dodo? Around? It might not be a dodo. And then what about it? all its gut flora as well? Where's that oh, coming wow. from? Oh, wow. Can so you there's explain whole, a bit more about that? Well, all the uh, microorganisms that live inside our guts, which help us digest things and protect us from uh, pathogens and so on, um, these are that internal ecology of this animal, which has completely disappeared as well. So it's not just one species. It's hundreds and thousands of species, potentially. And that's true of mammoths as well, Indeed, all of these. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, we bring them back and they just get loads of illnesses. Yeah. They just suffer. Yeah. That's awful. Yeah. Wow. And run around literally like a headless... Yeah. Dodo. Because <laughs> they have no idea what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you've got the assemblage of carbon atoms there doesn't mean to say that's what it is. Can I throw that one to you guys? Okay, so, so uh, the pot... <laughs> The government <laughs> Brexit bonanza has freed up lots of government finances. <laughs> and oh. now the, the government said, the government at the time said, guess what, we, we can do it, we can bring back a dodo. So hands up, can we just go, hands up, yes, let's bring back a dodo. Doesn't cost any of you. This is just a, okay, okay, this is interesting, four or five. Oh, wow, oh. <laughs> suddenly everyone's like, oh, there's more hands going up, okay. And then who thinks, no, let's not do that, please. Yeah, that's about, do you know, I've done that, what I just did to you, I've done that for about 10 <coughs> years in schools, always it's about 50-50, mm -hmm. it's always 50-50. So how would we sort out that, if that was re reality, how would the country sort out? Because that is very Brexity, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 isn't it? But maybe we could just about get over our differences with each other. I really want a dodo, no, you disgust me! Yeah. But, <laughs> But like, could how would how would a country? You, I mentioned about Sweden, and and yeah, obviously they aren't doing that. They're bringing back the mammoth yeah. yet. But as a society, how would we make that decision? Because clearly, there's good ethical reasons. If half of the population is thinking we shouldn't do it, like, how would a country get through that well, ethical yeah. dilemma? So, so um, I one of the organisations I work for is the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, and they they do a lot a lot of the policy development comes through them and the de and we've actually developed a de-extinction policy um, and uh, I mean I think pretty quickly in the in the process it became clear that the likelihood of de-extinction as you've just described it ever ever being possible is so remote that we have to focus on what we can actually do okay so one of the things that we and, and this is going to come down to the rewilding discussion that we'll have later but one of the things we can do is say that for many of these species that have gone extinct there are proxies or, or species that can potentially perform the same 
uh, function in the ecosystem. The major reason for wanting to bring back organisms from the dead is because they were performing some function which is now gone with them. Classic example is um, it would be the uh, the germination in the, uh, it, that was carried out by the flightless mower in New Zealand. And there's this Rimu tree, isn't, uh, uh, there are a bunch of different trees where their, their seeds were only, they've only been ever been able to germinate them, as far as I can tell, by, by simulating the acidic environment in the crop of the mower. So, so you, you know, you would, but, but then you don't, once you figure that out, you don't need a mower. You could say, well, okay, then there are other ratites we could potentially use. And for example, on the islands of, uh, some, some islands off Mauritius at the moment, the extinct Mauritian tortoise, same islands as the dodo, the extinct Mauritian tortoise, is being replaced by the Aldabran tortoise, which still exists, to see if it can do the same things, if it can disperse seeds and alter the, and, and, and alter the landscape to make it look like how it was before um, yeah. we, we, we chopped it all down and replaced it with... So with, they're, they're kind of tools of rewilding kind of Exactly. Thing, okay? so, so the IUCN yeah. regulations evolved effectively from de-extinction into creating proxies for ecosystem uh, re regeneration. Okay. There's, you know, the next Jurassic franchise, I, I, I imagine that's a line they could go down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, if you're not yeah, taking yeah. notes. Um, okay, so continuing on that theme, actually. Okay, so we're, the, the pattern here, we've, we've got our dodo, potentially 50% of us are like, let's do this. 52%, yeah, let's do this. So we're now we've, we've just got to go with this, this, this living dodo. Okay, that brings us on to this wonderful book. And um, this is a book that uh, the, the lead character, Thursday, has a pet dodo called Pickwick. And in this alternative world... A uh, re-engineered mammoths regularly cause damage to local gardens. There's a Neanderthal rights movement, which is interesting in its own right. Uh, and I love this. The duck is extinct in this universe as well, which is just, just beautiful. So the rights, you're talking about storing DNA, and you said about earlier on basic research, and mm -hmm. people have access to this. If you have a situation where money could be made, for instance, I could imagine one of these as a lovely pet, okay? What rights would a de-extincted animal have in that respect? I mean, what would, what, what would stop commercial interests basically farming this, this animal? Is there any... There's quite a lot, of, know, regu there's a lot of regulatory framework out there for genetic modification. I mean, if that's what we're talking about. So, for example, there's this, I'm sure many of these people have heard of the, of the um, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing tool, which allows you to engineer in new genetic variants into, into organisms in principle. But in practice, uh, the chances of that being allowed to get to market, to be put out into the public domain, remain very limited, although people are, are experimenting on it in, 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 the, in, the, in the laboratory. So I think there's, there are lots of, there's a lot of regu regulatory framework there um, that's, that limits the way in which we can use genetic modification. Okay. Um, so at least in, in, in that sense, there, there's something out there. But you know, when it comes to ethics and rights, you know, of organisms, we don't have a very good history mm. of, in, of taking into account rights of, of different species other than our own. Um, yeah. And I think that that would be a very, very difficult uh, I mean, I think it would argument. be interesting to see, even if you could recreate a, a dodo, whether it would be regarded as a, a natural species, because it's a, essentially completely human-made. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. so would it have the same value as naturally wild animals that have evolved over millions of years if you've just recreated it in a laboratory. Could you, could you, obviously this is part of the pigeon family, is that right? Mm -hmm. So could you modify, you know, on TV the way they do it is you look at the code, well oh, this is the bit that controls its growth size and they just go, oh, let's turn it up to 11. Could you get a pigeon's DNA and alter it in a way to mimic a dodo? <laughs> What do you guys think? Well, we sort of genetically engineer you know, dog breeds. Yeah, okay. I mean, you selectively yeah. breed Has anyone ever tried to do that with pigeons? Don't you? Artificially so select oh, well, pigeons. I mean, they well, Darwin. 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 Charles Darwin, yeah. 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 But no, how, how big could you get a pigeon? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, the biggest pigeons today are the crown pigeons from uh, New Guinea. 
and they're still quite a lot smaller than that. Really? Yeah. Well, and we, but we do know the genetic basis of gigantism in dogs mm -hmm. and, and, and small mm. body size. Um, and so for certain uh, you know, domestic animals, we, we really do know uh, what's underpinning some of their, their traits. So if somebody was so inclined then, they could apply the same theories towards producing them. Yeah, I think it would also said, depend physiologically. Whether, whether when you, if you could do that, whether its bones would mm. grow at the rate required to support that larger volume or larger mass. Because might, you might generate your big pigeon, but its bit, bones aren't thick enough and it just bends and then... Which is all wobbly. Yeah, because okay. as a species, yeah. we're all sort of like, well, that's why even as a, as a, as a human, there's a sort of height range, isn't there, which is, is feasible for existence. Yeah. And then beyond that, there comes problems. Yeah, me and, mechanical problems. And, yeah. Yeah. and those mechanical problems affect livestock, lots yeah, of, of course, livestock yeah. species. Yeah. Pets as well, yeah. dogs, Absolutely. I guess, as well. So, so, you know, it's not that all of these genes are acting in isolation of each other. There's yeah. a, there are consequences. Yeah. So, so... The, the next obvious question is, OK, so with the dinosaur thing, so there's a scientist called Jack Horner. Do we know Jack Horner? Mm -hmm. And one of his pet projects... So Jack Horner, it, the reason I know him is because he advised on the Jurassic Park films. And I had a poster of Jack Horner in my bedroom when I was 13 and Bob Backer, and they stood together. I was just like, wow, these guys. Anyway, uh, he's, uh, he's, got, he's got basically a scientific version of Mission Creep, because at the moment, one of his projects is to uh, look at the, the DNA of birds. And of course, birds are, you know, as we all know now, you know, a surviving part of the dinosaur family tree, you could argue. So you get a bird, and you look at its DNA, and you're like, oh, that bit's the beak. Let's just get rid of that bit of DNA, and you get to see what's uncovered behind. And, you know, that, that is quite, a cre personally, I find that quite a creepy sort of science. But is that an option for, de you know, resurrecting extinct creatures? Again, I guess you're not going to bring back a dinosaur. You're going to tell me you're bringing back a very malformed bird, is yeah. what you're going to tell me, aren't you? I, I mean, people have, people have now been able to look at the evolution of, of the different elements of the bird you know the the the, the class of aves, the, the 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 bird class, and um, and have been able to reconstruct what they think that the ancestral chromosomes will have looked like in structure, at least, yeah. for dinosaurs, um, for thera you know, for for theropods, and 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 so, you know, people are beginning to reconstruct the evolutionary processes, but there's a it's a, that's a world away from com you know being able to produce something that, that or guess. Even what the what the genetic component of a of a dinosaur would be, and there's and I would stress again, there's no way we can get dinosaur DNA. We can't resurrect dinosaur DNA. It's, and and it's, also, all the mechanisms required to switch on and off genes at the right time okay. in order to recreate. You have the code, but where are the, where's the instruction manual? Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's something that comes up time and time again when we hear sort of people and, and you know, if you're talking about DNA and they say, well, you know, you've got the gene for this and you've got the gene for that. But actually, it's, it's probably there in people. It's whether that's switched on or off, which is the okay. important bit. So actually just looking and comparing those DNA sequences is not enough for making a functioning being. So this is a whole different branch of genomics altogether. Yeah. One which is Does it frustrate spending. you guys as scientists in, involved really heavily, obviously, in this area to see, you know, all of these... Uh, you know, these, I don't know, the, the, the Mr. DNA kind of science, does it frustrate you how often we kind of get it wrong in the, in the cultural arena? Or are you kind of like, well, we're talking about it, that's important? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's only when people come to me with a sample and they said, well, they did it on CSI. And you kind of go, well, <laughs> <laughs> slightly different. You know? So I, I, I love the fact that it's kind of making people really aware of the use of sort of, of DNA and of, of sort of say, genetic technologies and that information and, that, and how many uses and applications it's got. And actually, they always say there's no such thing as a daft question, you know, so I think yeah. these questions are great. I don't usually think that when they've sort of gone away, tutted and said, like, well, such and such could do it, you know, on, yeah. the, on the TV. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. And I gave them a hair and this is what the person looked like, you know, yeah. that, that sort of... Okay, <laughs> cool. I, think, I think life's too short to be upset by what Hollywood does. <laughs> but I, but there's, a, there's a bigger problem, which is the general level of misinformation that's out there through, through the yeah, reputedly good media, you know, okay. and, and, you know, even the newspapers. And for those of us that are constantly working with uh, the news media, for example, making sure that you, you know, when the CryoArks project was announced, I, you know, my, our press office said, you know, the, uh, the Sun want to talk to you. And so, okay, so I'm happy to talk to the Sun. But of course, 
the angle that they took wasn't about what we were trying to do at all. It was really about, you know, would you like to see, an, you know, the dodo come back to life? Wow, right. that, was the, that was all they were interested in. And, and, and I don't mind speculating, none of us mind speculating to some extent, but also we need to be rooted in what's, what's real and what's now as well. Yeah, now talking about what's real and what's now, um, should we look at our final clip, which is uh, of the Meg? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> see how we get. I'm not sure what the clip is actually. I've, I've, um, okay, here we go. What's happening? It's a huge split. It's got the glider. Warning, capsule pressure. Mac, it's crushing me. It's crushing me. I don't think the glider can take it. It's not going to hold. Two years. Engage the pressure compensator. Compensator will not engage. Capsule breach in 10 seconds. Capsule breach in 5 doing what he does uh, best, and he does actually punch a shark in the film. Um, so, uh, okay, so we've talked about how um, our friend the Dodo, you know, there's different options for that. As you say, dinosaurs, sounds like it's not going to happen. Well, you know, apart from, you know, this dinosaur here, but, you know, the, the old days, the old dinosaur's not going to happen. So what scope is there <laughs> for animals that we thought were extinct being rediscovered as alive. Now, the Meg, Megalodon, this shark, survives because there's some sort of, sort of place under the, the bottom of the sea where the salt concentration forms a wall, an impenetrable wall, and these animals are down there, and then the wall breaks and Meg gets into the ocean and causes all sorts of havoc. That sort of science comes up a lot, and I, I often get asked uh, questions to do with, you know, once extinct animals, they, they could still be here. Technically... Those kids that say that to me could be right. I mean, I agree. I know, I agree. There's absolutely no... I just can't see how, of course, we don't see, you know, bite marks. We don't see... The fossil evidence just doesn't stack up. We don't see these animals washing up on a beach like every other once presumed mysterious animal would do. But scientifically, they've kind of got a point. They always often come back at me and say, well, you can't... We, we haven't got... You know, just because absence of evidence is not whatever that phrase is. So is there any hope for Megalodon fans? Is there any hope for these poor children in my classes? Well, I, it, just as a, a kind of a, a, a side issue, species get rediscovered every year. Mm -hmm. So the IUCN red list of endangered species has species becoming declared extinct or become go, be a higher, and there are some that are, um, are rediscovered. So that happens. Uh, it happens a lot. Species that have been thought to be extinct for centuries get rediscovered. Um, and, and, you know, there's been some very interesting um, uh, issues uh, recently about controversy about the Australian night parrot, which is a species that was thought to be extinct, recently thought to be rediscovered. Now everybody's thinking that was probably incorrect. But a classic one is the thylacine. The, the, the Tasmanian uh, tiger, as some people call it, which is this very, very large carn uh, marsupial carnivore that lived probably until 50, 60, maybe 100 years ago. This is the one you sometimes see movie footage of. Yeah, from, you, from, you from, 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 ZS, from the, from the from London Zoo. There was yeah. one in London Zoo. Yeah, wow. Um, and the thylacine, um, and we, we've, we've actually sequenced lots of, and expressed lots of its DNA now because there was a pub that was in ethanol and people have sequenced that. Wow. Um, and uh, the thylacine is a species where it's highly unlikely, but it's certainly not impossible that, that they could be um, rediscovered. Um, that's probably the most the, the marquee one that you that you might you might consider. A, uh, my colleague um, does field work in Mexico, and he's rediscovered two extinct species of amphibian, and rediscovered them again. So one was the Puebloan pool frog, 
which was discovered in 1955, and it was only found in one pool in Mexico, and then it disappeared, and he re rediscovered it somewhere else in 2010. And the other one was the crested toad, which again he rediscovered and was thought to be completely extinct. So, but these are quite small things. Mm. You know. What, no. so not not megalodon <laughs> size, no. Although the Pueblo pool frog is quite a decent size. It's, uh, okay. it's a big green <laughs> frog, but it's not 20 metres long. <laughs> and, and what's even more exciting is yeah. that we are still discovering new species. Mm. First of all, we, don't, we probably only know about you know, one third of the total number of species on the planet that have, been, have only been described anyway. But it could, and it could be even lower proportion. But the most important thing is we're still discovering like monkeys. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's there's a lot of incredibly interesting biodiversity that's still out there to be discovered now. You know, as so so you know, I, I think that that's uh, that that's you know very a very important point to make. Yeah, there's still yeah. a lot of wonderful biodiversity that we still have yet to discover. And what about I don't know plesiosaurs living in a lake? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those, yeah. What's not, interesting about that? Not too far that? from here, what's, you mean. <laughs> what's, what's, what's interesting is when you have certain, I mean, the Loch Ness Monster is actually quite a good example of that, where you have uh, a kind of, um, not cultish, but, you know, there's so much energy around that species, and this idea that, wow, this thing could be, and people are, I want to make a name for myself as the rediscoverer of the, this animal. And whether or not, you know, your colleague, you said, who discovered those toads, I just wonder whether or not certain animals, there's a sort of magic to them, I guess. You know, and as you say, unfortunately, and I, I'm a massive, well, we've already established that we love a good newt, but like, you know, I'm a big fan of amphibians, but it just seems to me like they're not the, the, the extinct animals everyone's running out to find. Mm -hmm. Whether, are there thylacine hunters, so to speak, you yeah, know? Totally. There are groups oh, for of them. Sure. And night parrot, you, similar yeah, for yeah, them, yeah, 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 kind yeah, of, yeah, there these are. These groups of like, almost like, Twitcher types, is it? Yeah. No, well, there are. There was the ivory billed woodpecker, wasn't oh, it? Yeah, my word, that, <laughs> was, a, that was the... That so was the ivory billed woodpecker was... Is that, that fantasy Florida? ornithology? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it was in Louisiana, wasn't yeah. it, that we rediscovered, supposedly rediscovered it, but it wasn't. Is there any... Do you think... This is a very hard question to answer, but do you think there's any extinct animals that you have a gut feeling they're going to be back? Mm. Mm. It is yeah. a hard one, sorry. But there's no... I don't know, but I think that kind of sort of going slightly back there when you were saying that <clears throat> ultimately there's people looking up, looking out and trying to find these huge big charismatics it captures people's imaginations and actually this is a, a real same issue but if you look up so I'm, I've got insulin pump it's beeping away at me so yeah but but in in general in conservation as well is trying to actually appreciate that it you know it's more than just the big things the big kind of sexy things we want to look for there's so many species of saying that we don't know about in, invertebrates and, and lots of amphibians that we're not really looking for so you say well we don't know if they're not there so therefore, should we be putting more effort into that? Should we be just focusing on looking at the big things? And I mean, Nessie is 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 really it captures lots of imagination. But do you have people looking the same for this? What was it, ivory billed woodpecker or some yeah. random little beetle? But and and I think it I think it, it it means that the the likelihood of finding anything is only ever going to be biased towards one particular group. Do you know? So in yeah. terms of like whether it's going to yeah. come back or find it again. Well, I have a theory I, that the Loch Ness monster is extinct <laughs> because of big cat sightings. <laughs> because in order to see Loch Ness Monster, you had to go to Loch Ness. You can see a big cat anywhere. And if you notice, the sightings of Loch Ness Monster have dropped away to virtually nothing. And it's because you can go anywhere and see a big cat and, and report it and get excited about wow, it. Wow, that is a bold claim. I love it. So yeah. what, it's just like I can basically become a superstar <laughs> on YouTube so, with my phone and a, and a black cat. Yeah. It's easier than getting yeah, up to big Loch Ness. Toy out in the woods somewhere. Yeah. How interesting. No wow. Very interesting <laughs> roll of <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, do you know, I think that's a good time to, to throw it out to you guys, really. Um, so we have got a, a roving mic, is that right? Got, uh, maybe a couple of roving mics. If you guys have got any questions uh, about anything, if you've got any questions about anything that's been raised tonight, sorry, these Channel 4 things they say, but yeah, questions for our fabulous speakers then, yeah, do put your hand up and uh, let's get a mic to you. <clears throat> yeah, we were speaking about the trying to get a dodo back, but something more pra more possible like with the, the extinct quagga. Mm. Reminds what a quagga had, is. Uh, uh, there was a time when they said they were going to try and regenerate a quagga from a breeding system, but uh, I don't know if it could be done yeah. in, in another way. Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right. In fact, that's, that's a programme that's ongoing. 
Um, and I don't know if you know what a quokka looks like, but essentially it uh, was a southern population of the plain zebra that had basically a solid um, merging of the stripes at the hind quarters, so it looks like a brown zebra, yeah. effectively. Um, and people have basically, what they've done is they've, they have been crossbreeding individuals within a captive population of plain zebras which we know genetically were the same, were very similar to, um, to quokkas because one of the very first ancient DNA studies ever published that was credible mm -hmm. came from the Natural History Museum where they were able to sequence a bit of the quokka DNA and say, yes, this, is, this fits in with the plain zebra group. Um, <clears throat> and so they've been, art well, basically doing artificial selection, to, like breeding a dog breed or something to produce something that looks like uh, planes, um, a, a quokka. From my perspective, on the, on, the, on the spectrum of what's bonkers and what's not bonkers, that's the least bonkers. Because um, provided you are keeping them in an, in an environment where they could potentially um, uh, you know, be, be re-released, -re I don't see a huge harm in, in that kind of, you know, sort of um, selection program. Because eventually you put them back out into nature and natural selection will do, it, do its stuff. If they are rubbish, they'll, they won't last, will they? Um, so, so I actually think that that's probably the least of the problematic approaches um, that, that's out there. And, 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 and it's, I think the program is continuing. Yeah. They haven't got very far. They don't look very quokka-like, I must say. They're pretty, they're just like, you know. But I think it was much more variable than... Yeah. You think, and that's the problem. It wasn't yeah. just one thing. It just yeah. merged, great, you know, gradually into the yeah. more fully striped ones. So the genes never really disappeared. They were always out there. It's just yeah. getting the right mix together. Thank you very much. Great question. Yeah, lovely. Uh, any other questions from any of you guys? Is it the Brexit thing? Am I just you? Just all like, oh no, this is awful. <laughs> um, well, oh, did we miss something? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, go on. Um, I was just wondering, you were saying with around 40,000 samples getting stored, what you were most excited for, or if you could choose the next sample to kind of be stored, thinking as, as wildly as you like, what you'd be interested in seeing in those freezers? Wow, that's a great I can question. I can tell you, because I saw it in our big freezer today, <laughs> and that's a Shaco and Peccary, and this is a really good example of something that was extinct. Um, in 1975, somebody found this this big peccary in Paraguay. And when they looked at it, they found that it was a species unknown to science. When they looked at it a bit more closely, they found that it was known to science, but it was actually a fossil from the Ice Age. So that was really a very extinct species, that uh, apparently extinct, that popped up. And we've got two in our freezer, and I'm really keen to get those samples into, into the uh, minus 80 freezers, because they're the only ones in the UK. Lovely, good question. That sounded like a planted question. You were so, no, no. so animated. It was fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, any other questions from any of you guys? Oh, yeah, go on. Yeah, just over here. That's great. I was just curious if you were hoping to ever expand your freezer collection outside of the UK, um, like getting samples from the Smithsonian in, in America or something like that. Yeah. I could, yeah, so, so absolutely, and um, there are frozen, you know, frozen collections and frozen zoos. San Diego, of course, has the frozen zoo. <clears throat> the Smithsonian does have its own frozen collection. Um, we are very keen, I mean, the frozen ark, which is the other hat that I wear, we're very keen to encourage the establishment of biobanks in as many countries as possible. Um, because the, the genetic resources from those countries belong to those countries. In a purely practical sense, one of the main drivers for the CryoArks biobank is it is becoming impossible to import genetic material into, into the UK from other countries because of a new piece of legislation called the Nagoya Protocol. Sounds like a book, doesn't it? The Nagoya <laughs> Protocol. The Nagoya Protocol is actually a set of, of rules that have been developed to stop biopiracy. Biopiracy is where rich countries or pharmaceutical companies or whatever go into developing countries, find something that they think is potentially very, very valuable commercially, take it illegally from the, that country, 
and then develop it into a highly commercially valuable product. And that product then, the, none of the money from that goes back to the original country. And so the Nagoya Protocol was dev developed to, um, to stop that happening. Um, and an unfortunate and unintended consequence of the Nagoya Protocol is that it's impossible now, becoming impossible to move um, genetic samples around willy-nilly. So that means it's even more important that biobanks get set up in their own countries. And, you know, the US and the UK will, will be all right, you know. It, but the, the problem is, you know, how about some of the you know, least developed countries that have the most biodiversity, potentially the most valuable biodiversity? They need to be protected. And that's why the Nagoya Protocol is really important. But it is a headache for us now. And it's part of the driver for cryoarchs is so that, the, the, so that UK PLC has its own you know, genetic resource bank that we can, that we can use. And that's why actually zoos are so important because um, there, a lot of that material is, is on, is, you know, the, yeah. we have more than 100 zoos and aquaria in Britain. So, and also any animals, vertebrate animal specimen that comes into the museum, we always take a tissue sample, whether it's from a zoo or in the wild, whether it's from within the UK or outside. So whatever we get, we do store a sample. And of course, I think as well, the samples that we we're, we're, we're keep talking about, but they are still a finite resource to an extent. There is only so much muscle that you can mm -hmm. bank, um, how much tissue and how far that will go in terms of what data you get out of it. Sort of these biobank sort of initiatives is not just to store those samples, but then try and keep a track as well of the genetic data that's produced from that, which can have many more applications than maybe just the person who is generating the data in the first place. So benefiting countries, which whilst they might not have the facilities for storing and preserving the samples, can actually then access the genetic data that came from them and sort of use that as well. So. Or, or back up. I mean, because especially yeah. many, many countries in, in uh, least developed parts of the world, um, their electricity supply is not very assured. And so we, we can have, provide a mutual backup. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that we want yeah. to do. It sounds, just from hearing you guys speaking today, it's actually really reassuring that, <laughs> is it safe? I mean, like, you, we're talking about, like, you know, these fridges, and you, you've got, I'm looking at the clock, and you've, you're desperate to get back to your fridges, no doubt, and just test them out <laughs> and Jesus, stuff. Jesus, we're not that sad. See they go, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, like, when I get something new, I just want to get in and unwrap it, you must, anyway, we don't need to talk about that, but, um, do you... The electricity supply for these fridges, there would never be a situation, would there? Would there uh, maybe a meteorite from space or something like that. But are they backed up? There was a story a couple of years ago, the, the Seeds Initiative, and it was one of these stories that got exaggerated a bit. But, you know, the, the seed... The Svalbard gene yes, bank. Yes, that's yeah, it. Yeah, when, that, when it started to thaw out, where, the, where there was... And yeah. they lost some samples there. You know, is the science of protecting samples now pretty strong? Yes. Uh, so... so um, Almost all important frozen facilities, the freezers are linked up um, to a mobile phone network. And so, um, you know, if, if there's a problem, if the, if the temperature goes down below minus 75, Jill will get a call. Doesn't matter where she is, what she's doing. What she's doing. You know. Do you have a special phone? <laughs> yeah, it's the freezer that talks to me and it tells me there's a problem. Oh, so. wow. if, 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 if she doesn't yeah. answer, I get the call. <laughs> <laughs> And so it goes on. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's, we put a lot of things in place to, to ensure that, for a start, you don't want to have these freezers on a plug socket that the cleaner might put the, yeah. the, the oh, Hoover yeah. into and turn it off. You know. So, so we obviously put what as many practical measures as we can, including having these alarms, including having security cameras and things to kind of make sure that we're monitoring the access as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are daily records being kept of how these freezers. But having backup facilities as well. I know that the um, the molecular facility at the Natural History Museum has been doing a trial on how can you run empty freezers um, so that if one of them breaks, you can transfer those straight across. Yeah. Because you don't really have an indefinite amount of time for doing that either. And, I, and it's quite a short recommended time actually for putting it, yet the time it takes to bring that freezer right down to temperature to be ready is quite a long time. So, yeah. so it's, it's and trying to... having an empty to... minus 80 freezer expends a lot of energy. I'm sure. So, so, cool. so, yeah. so it sounds like we're in safe hands. Thank you so much for letting us pick apart these things. Personally, it's been a massive honour. I've learned so much, and I'm sure you guys do uh, feel exactly the same. So can we just express our love with a lovely... <laughs> Thank you very much. 
So uh, have a lovely evening. Clean your own fridges or your freezers. Do what you need to do tonight. Uh, have a great rest of the Edinburgh Science Festival. Thank you very much for letting us do this tonight and coming along. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. <laughs>